As Art was proceeding t- towards combat in Europe, Dan was returning back to the States after his tour in the Mediterranean. He had accepted a, a position as a training pilot, although this was not the normal flight instructor training that many pilots did where they would take new pilots up and teach them the rigors of flying and progress them to more and more advanced aircraft. As the war had progressed, the Army Air Force had developed training methods for almost all its positions that it found were pretty effective. They had, obviously, multiple levels of pilot training, pilot gunnery training, both learning from the ground and then using training aircraft to go after towed ribbons and targets. They had bomber training where the bomber pilots could learn to fly slow and steady paths to deliver accurate bomb loads while their bombardiers could fly over miniature maps and practice dropping bombs and then turn around and start dropping uh, dummy bombs from other aircraft that mimicked the same flight pattern as the bombs they'd be dropping in combat. The one area that they kept coming up short was training the defensive gunners on these bombers. Unlike most of the regular gunnery practice, in their experience, most of the planes would be coming straight at them as these enemy fighters would be coming in to attack the bombers, not flying side to side, which is what a lot of the other gunnery training was. Well, late in the war, they started to develop a new plan for this. Bell Aircraft Company had developed the P-63 King Cobra. This was a modern fighter, although it wasn't used by the U.S. forces in combat. It was largely sent to the Soviets and some to other Allied Air Forces through the Lend-Lease program. They did, however, retain a sizable number and convert them to what were known as RP-63 pinballs. These were regular King Cobra aircraft that had all the armament stripped out, including the cannon that fired through the spinner in the nose, and instead had over a ton of extra armor put on, had a giant light put in the nose, and then had sensors put in. And what would happen is these pilots would fly these aircraft and mimic attacking German or Japanese aircraft, and the gunners on these bombers would then fire frangible, meaning breakable, lead and plastic bullets at these heavily armored bombers, and when they would score hits, the light in the nose would light up so they knew they'd scored on the target. Needless to say, this is a rather unorthodox method, and it had some major drawbacks. One, pilots coming back from combat who were put into this role were hesitant to act- actively engage in it as they had actually been shot at for real, and were not eager to have anything shot at them, and it took them quite a few tries to realize that they couldn't even feel the impact of these bullets on their airframe. Many times they, they went up and thought the bomber gunners had completely missed, and when they came down and checked the counter, they'd been hit dozens of times. Another downside to this was that fighters are, by design, somewhat unstable, which allows them to be highly maneuverable, and the P-63, in its normal configuration, was a highly maneuverable aircraft. However, with all this additional armor added on, it became incredibly stable, which is great for nice smooth flying, but meant that they weren't very effective at mimicking what the German fighters would do when approaching the bombers. Instead, they ended up making large sweeping turns and banks and were very much reduced in their aerodynamic capabilities. Another issue the Army hadn't foreseen was that while Dan was pretty typical of the pilots doing the training, he was only 22 at the time he was doing the training, and the men he was training as far as the bomber crews, were often only 18. So they soon worked out a system. The bomber crews didn't want to stay in training any longer than they had to and were eager to fly their actual missions. And the crews of the planes that they were shooting at were happy to help them out and soon realized that if they flew alongside these bombers at a fairly steady and slow rate, these gunners could rack up incredible scores and finish their training. And the the crews were so excited they would often treat them to drinks afterwards before they shipped off to Europe. Dan recounted many years later it dawned on them that this was probably not a very effective way of training these crews who had artificially high scores racked up and then shipped off to Europe and, as he said, quote, couldn't hit a damn thing with one of those machine guns. Another benefit Dan had to having this training duty was that he was located on the East Coast, very close to New Jersey. So when he had leave passes, he would just go home and spend time there and not have to spend money on hotels or anything else. Plus, he'd be able to go visit his parents and do things in his hometown. It was on one of these trips that he looked in the garage and found the 1941 Nash that Art had bought after Dan had already entered the service and driven directly from the dealership to the garage and put a tarp over it. Dan, seeing a free car, immediately took the tarp off and started using it, figuring Art wouldn't mind a few miles on it. And he continued in this training duty and staying on the East Coast until the war ended and then he was discharged from service. Art, being deployed to Camp Shelby, Mississippi, 
after his combat tour in Europe had ended, then found out he was not going to be deployed to the Pacific Theater to fight the Japanese. While he was there, the war ended following the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and then began a great mass movement of people throughout the United States. Obviously, the army wasn't going to release all of the soldiers it had, but it was demobilizing hundreds of thousands of men in a very short period, and Art was in a bit of a race to try to find out how he could get back to the armory at Elizabeth, New Jersey, where he would be out-processed. The army offered transportation, but it also only issued orders stating where they needed to be and when, so if these soldiers had ways to get there quicker or on their own, they were encouraged to do so. This led to a lot of negotiating and knowing friends of friends, and this is how Art ended up finding a plane ride back to New Jersey. Someone Art knew hooked him up with a Navy pilot who was flying a Grumman TBF Avenger torpedo bomber back to the New York area. The Grumman Avenger was a rather large single-engine carrier-based torpedo bomber that had replaced earlier highly ineffective models and become a primary weapon that the U.S. had used to attack the Japanese Navy in the Pacific Theater for the second half of the war. It not only carried a, torpedoes, but could carry bombs and serve as a level bomber, and carried a crew of anywhere between three to five, depending on its configuration. The one Art was taking back was only carrying a single pilot in it, and he offered Art the tunnel gunner position. One of the crew members on an Avenger was a radio operator who, sit da who sat down inside the fuselage of the plane, operating the radio system and communicating with other aircraft. Behind the, his position was a long bed that he could lay down on, and it had a 30 caliber machine gun that faced at a re downward, rearward-facing window, so that when they were in combat, instead of operating the radio, he could lay down there and provide defensive fire from any enemy fighters that were approaching them. The advantage of this was that it was already built like a bed. Art had plenty of padding with him since he was carrying his gear and kit, and this was a place where he could lay down. The Avenger is not a particularly fast aircraft. It's probably going to be cruising at under 200 miles an hour all the way from Mississippi to New York. So he figured he would lay down there and, and take a nap and enjoy the ride. The pilot was going to be flying anyhow, so off they went. After reaching altitude, Art soon fell asleep, and they traveled on for hours and hours. Unfortunately for Art, the pilot also was getting tired, so he clicked on the autopilot after getting the plane going in the right direction, and apparently at some point he dozed off as well. When Art awoke, the plane had come out of the autopilot unexpectedly and rolled over and begun a nosedive. As they were basically in a free fall, Art was not secured to anything as he was laying on this bed, started floating around effectively in the tail cone of the aircraft, while the pilot woke up, turned off the autopilot, and was struggling to get the plane back under control. As they continued the descent, Art went further and further up into the tail cone until his head became wedged between the bulkhead and another piece of equipment. The pilot was able to gain control level out the plane, and then call down to Art to make sure he was okay, only to find that Art's head was still stuck in, in this wedge between the bulkhead and the equipment. The pilot, realizing he had to make an emergency landing, found the nearest airfield and landed. And this is when the Navy lost a TBF Avenger for good. They soon found that they could not extract Art's head without scraping up his scalp and possibly damaging his skull, so instead they had to cut the tail off of the plane and then cut the bulkhead so they could get him out. He ended up with only some minor cuts, but it ended his chance of getting home as early as he had hoped. When Art was released by the medic, he found out that they were actually in western Pennsylvania, so it was only a matter of hitching a ride with a few soldiers in the area who were already heading towards New York, and he was able to reach Elizabethtown, New Jersey, and go to the armory to get his out-processing completed and actually leave the army. Once his processing was complete, he then got on a bus and was headed back to Springfield, New Jersey. When Art got back to Springfield, he was excited to see his family, who he had not seen in almost four years. When he arrived, however, the only one there was his mother, Mary. So he unpacked, visited with her for a little bit, and then went out to the garage, where he made a horrible discovery. He saw the tarp sitting over his car, and when he pulled the tarp back, he found not his brand new 1941 Nash, but his 1941 Nash that his brother Dan, at some point in the preceding weeks, had run into a tree, probably after some alcohol consumption, and then he and his buddies wheeled it back into the garage and put the tarp back over it, 
We're not sure what Dan thought was going to happen, but it wasn't good. A few hours later, and clearly after some carousing with his friends, Dan came walking down the street. As he approached, he saw Art out in front of the garage and immediately knew he was in trouble. As the words got heated and the voices got louder, their mother realized that there was about to be a large fight in their house, and she did the only thing she felt she could do. She screamed with them to wait, grabbed up all the liquor bottles, and took them out in the backyard, as it was soon apparent that her 6'4 and 6'7 sons were about to have a large brawl in the house, which immediately ensued. We don't know exactly what happened, but she reported she sat outside until things got quiet, at which point Art came out and said, you might as well bring that liquor and I think we're going to need some. Obviously, they had made up and despite the anger over his car, was glad to see his brother again. And it was a good thing they didn't do too much damage to the house, as the next day was Thanksgiving, 1945, and they were expecting company. Following the war, Art returned to his prior occupation as a truck driver. While he had worked for Cardinal Trucking, the same company his father worked for, prior to the war, after the war, he ended up getting a job with Coca-Cola. For the next 30 plus years, Art was a truck driver and proud teamster and drove Coca-Cola products in and out of New York City on a daily basis. In 1947, Art met and married Audrey Rogers from nearby Stanhope, New Jersey, and they soon began raising a family, including my father, Robert Bob Staley. Art continued driving for Coca-Cola until he retired in the late 1970s, and enjoyed his retirement staying in Springfield, New Jersey until he passed away late in the summer of 1984. After the war, Dan, who had only been in high school prior to enlisting, ended up going into the masonry business and running his own masonry company uh, for many years until he retired. He ended up getting married shortly after Art did and raising a family of his own. One thing Dan continued to do was to fly. Throughout his entire life, he owned various aircraft and flew all over, including many trips down to Florida where he would have reunions with his fellow squadron mates. Dan continued flying right up until he passed away in spring of 1998.